fox hunting has always been a tradition in Ireland and in a land where horses play such an important part in the lives of the people, this country pursuit is still as popular as ever. The County Galway Foxhounds, the Blazers, is one of the most famous hunts in the world. This pack from the west of Ireland was formed more than 150 years ago in 1839, and the unique countryside where they hunt has changed little since then. Over several centuries, a hound has been developed through selected breeding to be an ideal fox hunter. The land here is generally flat and mostly limestone, which lets it drain well, so for the field, the going is good and fast. Few modern intrusions have scarred the Galway landscape the naturally stony terrain was cleared for pasture and these stones were used to build the miles of walls which still separate each field of grassland. These walls and other natural hazards create a lattice work of inviting jumps for the keenest fox hunter. Different types of hound are better for different types of hunting country. Galway country is some of the most testing to be found. This pack must be light, agile, and full of stamina to cope with any obstacle that gets in their way, and they must be just as keen as the riders who follow them. The sport in Galway is immensely popular, but unfortunately the number of paying followers has to be restricted from time to time to avoid undue damage to the countryside and crops. As always, the field master must keep the riders in order 
and if necessary, he must divert them from the true line to avoid churning up the land. Farmers here are more tolerant than most, but that's Galway country for you. Foxes know their patches well, but will be looking for safety, and the first available bolt hole may be several miles away. The hounds have run this one to ground, and Michael Dempsey, the huntsman, and his whips must try to stay with the pack, even if it means dismounting. A hunt has a job to do, and farmers expect to see foxes killed. As if by magic, the Hunt Terrier man, known well locally for his uncanny understanding of country lore, is seldom far from the spot. Gil Morrissey has followed all that's been going on by road and track in his Land Rover. The incredibly aggressive little terriers don't kill the fox, but track him down through the underground network of tunnels. Their agitated barking lets Gil know exactly where the fox is. The rocky undersoil here makes burrowing difficult for the fox, but even harder work for the hunt staff who have to make the effort to dig him out. Hounds have been called off to find another fox while the terriers and terrier man, an essential part of the team, ensure that the job is done. When at last the fox is finally dug out, Gil is waiting and the final coup de grace will be instant. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are, March 25th, 1989. On March the 25th, 1839, 150 years ago, the County Galway Hunt was formed. So before starting our committee meeting, uh, uh, I would like to ask the Honorary Secretary to read the minutes of the meeting held on March the 25th, 1839. Janet, could you please read the minutes? At a preliminary meeting held in the coffee room of the Grand Jury Room on March the 25th, 1839, Sir M.D. Bellew Bart in the chair. One, by County Galway is almost perfect hunting country. With few natural minerals, Ireland never really had an industrial revolution, so the landscape has remained largely unchanged for many years country pursuits have been able to thrive. Galway is ideal for riding to hounds, since all the walls make wire, the bane of the chase almost unnecessary. The County Galway Hunt is supposed to have got its nickname the Blazers, when celebrations after a visit to the neighboring Almond Pack left a hotel in ashes. The hunters thrived from these rather notorious beginnings and family links with the past and a succession of long-serving masters have continued the tradition. The first, John Dennis, appointed after the inaugural meeting of the County Galway, served for 11 years until 1850, although a hunt had been in existence some 10 years earlier, Robert Purse's Castle Boy Hunt Club. John Dennis was followed by another member of the Purse family, Burton, who held office for a remarkable 30 years. But on his death, the hunt committee bought his hounds and put them in temporary accommodation until his nephew, Lord Clan Morris, took over. Burton owned the pack privately and kenneled them at his ancestral home, My Old Castle. These new kennels at Crockwell were designed and built by Clan Morris and his huntsman, Jack Press, and are still in use today. Another family who has had long connections with the Blazers were the Pickers Skills. Joe was a master from 1911 to 1922. And his son, Paddy, 
hunted them during the last two years of the war. He took the horn again in 1956 and was joined the following year by a well-known Galway man, Peter Patrick Hempill, who is another long-serving and distinguished master. Others include the two sporting majors, Bose Daly of Dunsandle, who hunted hounds for 12 years, and Philip Profumo, who held office for six. Jerome Mahoney followed in his father's footsteps to be chairman of the Blazers. He is seen here with the late father Lochnan, who hunted keenly into his 80th year. Brian Fanshaw from England was part of a tradition of joint masters from overseas. He hunted hounds in the late 60s and early 70s. The attraction of hunting here has even tempted several masters from the United States too. From 1903 to 1908, New York-born Ike Bell was master and huntsman. He always dreamed of hunting a pack of hounds and this came true with the Blazers. And perhaps the most famous of all, the celebrated film director John Huston. He amazed the locals by flying in stars like Marilyn Monroe and Frank Sinatra. Right, well now, the, what might interest <coughs> members of the present committee is that 150 years on, uh, we still have uh, uh, various people associated with the County Galway Hunt from its beginning. We have Mrs. Smith here, our Vice Chairman. Uh, we have also have the honour and the pleasure of having a Grant Bellew as a Joint Master. And all I can say is that I hope that in 150 years from now, <laughs> the descendants of the people sitting around this table will be doing the same for us. In Ireland, uh, pubs or bars as they are called here play a great part in community life. Guinness brewed with the liffy water tastes even better in its home country. In some of the smaller villages, there can be nearly as many bars as people. Spirit measures are always generous. In Ireland, a single is a double. In many bars, the din of a modern jukebox is replaced by singing and listening to traditional songs. Often, by the end of an evening, everyone is joining in and doing their own turns. Prints of old chases are seen worldwide in even the most modern pubs, bars and steakhouses, on walls, table mats and pub signs everywhere. Hunting and pubs have always gone together. It's a link with the past and continues as much today as ever. First whip, Tom Dempsey, and Terrier Man Gill, however, have work to do before they can go down the road to the bar. Life in hunt service doesn't conform to the usual nine to five, Monday to Friday routine. If a job has to be done, it has to be done whatever the time. Here, a cow, which has died of natural causes and is unfit for human consumption, has been collected by the hunt to feed the hounds. It has to be butchered, and it's not a particularly pleasant job. But it happens nearly every day, and the hunt depends on it. Fox hunting as a sport takes place during the autumn, winter and early spring months.
but preparation and maintenance of the pack is a full-time job. The young hounds have much to learn, and to stop them wandering off during exercise, they are often coupled to one of their more senior colleagues. Michael Dempsey, joint master and huntsman of the Blazers, is the man in charge, with total responsibility for the pack. It's a family affair here, with son Tom whipping in. A huntsman must have complete rapport with his hounds, and Michael knows each one, not only by name, but by character. That's how he keeps control. From his earliest days, he always wanted to hunt this pack, but he carried the horn for two other Galway hunts before eventually taking over at Crockwell in 1978. As joint master and huntsman, Michael does much of the public relations work with the farmers and landowners, as well as running the kennels. The horses, which are the grooms, not Michael's responsibility, have a summer break, but the hounds have to get fit well before the season starts. Michael and Tom, too, have to start toning themselves up with pedal power. Every day during the warm summer months, the whole County Galway pack pound the lanes of Athen Rye led by their master and wait for the season to begin. This road work is good for them it hardens the pads of their feet for the rocky country they will soon be hunting over, and it gets them fit. It also reminds the older hounds and teaches the younger ones to work as a unit. Preparation continues through to August when cub hunting starts. With the blazers, only those closest involved with the hunt take part. Invited followers would be more of a hindrance than help in this potentially treacherous Galway countryside, as the walls and stones can be invisible in the high grass. With the beginning of the season creeping up and the horses back in work, the young foxes are reaching maturity in the wild. Although the hunt would like to account for some of them during this period, cub hunting is really more concerned with training and re-education and with learning to hunt one fox at a time. Hounds mustn't be distracted. During the season proper, the pack is split up. But at this stage, all 120 hounds are taken out for as many as 60 days to give them the necessary preparation. This forestry plantation is within hacking distance from Crockwell and is a haven for foxes, providing ample cover but also good scenting possibilities for the hounds. Cub hunting not only provides the young ones with the first taste of battle, but also nurtures the natural instinct of the pack. At this time of year, the morning sun evaporates scent quickly, so they need to get going well before breakfast time. Michael knows the area better than his hounds, but nowhere near as well as the foxes, 
and in this deep summer undergrowth the quarry can easily slip away. Darting through the bracken and using the walls for cover, the pack might just have lost him this time. Michael's got a pretty good idea where his fox has gone and decides to lead the hounds back onto the scent. This is one of the few times when a huntsman will ride in front of his pack. This young fox has broken cover, but if he outwits the hounds, it's not so important at this time of year. The experience for the pack will have been invaluable. But still, it's worth a chase. To keep the hounds eager for the chase, Michael feeds them only when they get home from their exertions. Their appetite for meat is obvious, and the hunt needs, on average, one carcass a day picked up from the local farms. It takes as much as this to keep the ever-hungry hounds properly fed and fit for hunting. Often, foxhound puppies are started on cereal foods after being weaned, but here at the Blazers, they too are fed on raw meat straight away. In this area of sheep and cattle farming, natural casualties happen every day. The phone never stops ringing at the kennels because the hunt is one local organization which would pick up the fallen stock. It doesn't charge for the service and isn't charged for the meat. This is all part of the continuing link between farmers with their land and the hunt who enjoy it. There's lots of activity at the kennels, even during the off-season. All year, things are going on, and one of the most important summer functions is the puppy show. The brooms and whitewash have been out in force, and everyone has lent a hand to make the kennels look spick and span for the guests. Again, it's Michael Dempsey who is in charge of the hound breeding program, and it's important for him to put on a good show. As at all hunt kennels, the puppy show at Crockwell is a thank you to the walkers, whose charges could win a prize for their conformation, looks and hunting potential. Visiting judges Jeremy Cairns from the North Tipperary and Johnny Smith from the West Meath know a good hound when they see one. Puppies are often entrusted to volunteers before coming back to the pack. The show is the walkers' reward. It's not a great hoolie, but it enables the keen followers to mark their cards and test their own judgment. The outside judges obviously consider their invitation an honor, but it also gives them a preview of hounds which could help their own hunts breeding program. In Galway country, hounds must be agile and lightly built 
so that the scrambling wave of the pack jumping the walls won't dislodge too many stones. The puppy show is a popular event, and although the prizes in the various categories may be modest, they are honorable nonetheless. Looking after animals is a full-time occupation and the kennels are always busy. The puppies, hounds and hunt horses all live together at the yard. For the little ones it's a marvellous adventure playground where animals come first. They always do in rural communities like this. Keeping horses is one of the greatest expenses for a hunt, since the other animals exist happily on fallen stock from farms. Most of the horse feed and bedding must be bought, and expert services like the blacksmith must be employed. Horses usually need shoeing about every three weeks, but in this testing country, it can be more often. Smithing is an ancient trade, and modern technology has not found any shortcuts to substitute for old-fashioned craftsmanship. Member subscriptions don't cover all the costs of running a hunt, so the County Galway, like all other hunts, have to organize fundraising activities. The Irish are even more keen on horse racing than the English, so the Blazers' annual point-to-point -point is one of their best means of raising money. Point-to-points are strictly amateur steeplechases for horses and riders who must qualify by subscribing and going out with a hunt for a specified number of days. The temporary racetrack is set on a local farm. All the hunt supporters get involved, including Michael Dempsey, who is honorary clerk of the course for the big day. He has to ensure that everything is just right for the horses, the jockeys, and hopefully for the large crowd that comes every year. Point to pointing started as an end of season jolly for hunting horses, but the thoroughbreds of today can be quite a handful when they are following hounds. It's some years since Michael has ridden in a race himself, but he loves point to pointing and keeps a racehorse at Crockwell. In his few moments of spare time in the spring, he becomes amateur trainer. His hope for tomorrow is Sam Sharrock, who has a good chance, but the horse must have a final pipe opener before the race. Okay. 
Race day, and a huge crowd is here to enjoy the sport. Hunt supporters all have much to do, and everyone has a different job on the day. The bookies do a brisk trade, as the Irish love to have a bet, but the odds offered at this sort of meeting won't win them a fortune. Some punters may have made their choice in advance, but for the undecided, there is the chance to see the runners parading in the paddock. Today, Blazers field master Willie Lee, who owns many of the horses that go out with the County Galway, is in charge of the paddock. Come on now, Jack is up please! Jack is up please! Michael has secured the services of one of Ireland's top amateurs, Tom Costello Jr. as jockey. But the trainer is boss and he gives Tom instructions on how to ride the race. The horse starts as favourite. <laughs> Michael's done all he can. Rather like when hunting his hounds, all the careful preparation is now in the hands of fate. Having led for a long way, the Dempsey maroon and white colours are overtaken in the closing stages of the three-mile race. Sam Sharrock has to make do with an honourable second. But he could easily reverse the form at another point-to-point -point next weekend. It was perhaps a shame the master's horse didn't win on home ground, but the trainer, having a day away from routine hunt matters, is delighted just the same. Come on, 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 come on,
on, little boys. Come on. Come on, Tiny. Sleep. Sleepy. Come on, Nippy. Come on, Nippy, boy. Come on, boy. Whatever else goes on throughout a year of the hunt, the care of horses and hounds and the country, it all leads to a single purpose, to provide a good season between October and February. The Atlantic winds can bring in any kind of weather, but in rain or shine, the hunt goes on. Foxes must be caught and sport provided for the followers. The Galway Blazers go out three days a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. But Tuesdays in Athenry country are regarded as the best. The cub hunting may have been largely confined to woodland, but the whole hunt country covers thousands of acres. The blazers' horses and hounds are loaded onto the same lorry to take them to a meet several miles away at Carty Moor. It's quite a major operation getting the whole show on the road, and the anticipation for a good day is high in what is still some of the best country in the world.
The fox population must be contained, and hunting them with hounds is an efficient way to do it here in Ireland. But the quarry can still get away. Here in Blazer country, foxes remain in healthy numbers, but under control. The countryside and lifestyle of Galway has changed little in 150 years, and the Blazers have given generations of followers some memorable days. Not surprisingly, this part of Ireland provides fox hunting enthusiasts from all over the world with some outstanding hunting, and is likely to do so for another 150 years. <laughs>